I'm going to start recording and we're going to go live on Facebook. Um, and as I get the live stream set up, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, if there's something you're really interested in learning tonight, you can go ahead and tell us in the chat. Um, at the end, um, Deja and I will promote folks who want. We won't force you to go on camera, but if you'd like to go on camera and you know audibly ask a question instead of typing it, we'll have some time at the end for you to do that too, um, because we want to make sure that your voice is heard. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here, everybody. We're so excited. Our Facebook live stream is almost set up. Uh, Carolyn, is it possible to stream to YouTube for this one? Oh, no. Oops. <laughs> oh, we will upload it to YouTube immediately after. Perfect. OK, great. Um, so we'll do both. The best of both worlds. Thanks to COVID, I now have a YouTube channel. Yeah. That's so exciting. We'll email you the MP4 right after. Perfect. Um, well, I think we're, we're right at time. So hello, everybody. My name is Caroline Nickerson. I'm with the SciStarter team. Um, it's my privilege to make it count every Monday with Deja Perkins, um, who's representing North Carolina State University. Um, tonight, we're going to be diving into all things um, mysterious bumpy beach park. So I'll let Deja get the intro started, and um, then we'll dive in. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Or if you're joining us for the first time, welcome to uh, uh, Make Account Monday, our weekly live stream show. Where we talk about citizen science. We're so happy to have you all join us today, um, especially as we talk with our special guest, who I'm so excited to introduce. Um, you guys are really in for a treat or for a treat as Caroline said, I think that was a great pun. Like I, I love it. <laughs> I would, um, I, I don't know if anybody is here because of our, um, our social media, um, our social media pushes this morning, but I definitely use one of those puns myself. Um, you know, asking for our budding treat enthusiasts. That was really as good as I could get it. Uh, but we do what uh, we like can. I said, welcome back. <laughs> yes, we do what we can. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you all here today um, in our weekly live stream show where we talk about citizen science. We're just going to have a casual um, conversation. And today we are talking with our special guest, Dr. Steph Jeffries, and we are talking about all things trees. Um, and so, Caroline, do you want to walk us through how to navigate the SciStarter um, webpage before we go through, before we introduce our special guest? Sounds like a plan. So I'm going to share my screen, everybody. And if you're watching later, or if you're watching live, feel free to minimize me right now and go ahead and type in scistarter.org forward slash NCSU dash home. And you know, even if you're watching the recording, don't be afraid uh, to comment. Um, I, we always respond to the YouTube comments or the Facebook comments. We really love having a dialogue with you. I know um, Steph Jeffries is also going to be uploading this to her channel. So we, we hope this is evergreen content, another tree pun. Um, but this is SciStarter. Um, SciStarter um, hosts over um, and helps people discover over 3,000 projects, events, and tools. Um, but to make the citizen science world a little smaller and to um, introduce uh, some special projects to you all, there's a microsite that is maintained by NC State's Citizen Science Campus and SciStarter. It's kind of your one stop for citizen science, because you can find um, a link to the Citizen Science Club, which is great if you're an NC State student or you know affiliated with the university. Um, info from the libraries. You can also return to the main Citizen Science Campus website. And the great thing about this website as well is you could just be part of the broader Wolfpack. You could just be a fan. You don't have to actually you know be an enrolled student to enjoy the projects on this um, site and to enjoy the shows. We welcome everybody. We have people from Indonesia tune into these events. Um, a, a real global presence. Um, so all are welcome and all are welcome to do these projects. There's a tutorial on this page um, that the NC State team created for you to introduce you to the, the who, the what, the how, and the why of citizen science. They created this in partnership with SciStarter, so that's customized just for you. Um, and there are a number of different projects. And each week, one of these projects is featured at our weekly live stream show, Make It Count Monday. We've covered Crowd the Tap, which allows you to join an investigation of safe drinking water. Spiral graph was this season. 
We um, help scientists measure the curvature of spiral arms and galaxies, and we established in that episode that neither Deja, nor I, nor our special guest, Dr. Patrick Troyhart, would go to space if we had the opportunity, but we can still map spiral galaxies from home, which I think is awesome. And then today, we have um, a special page for mysterious bumpy beach bark. Um, where you, after the show, let's say that you're more of a, a visual learner or maybe you want to spend some time reading on your own and really processing, this page will be up for you afterward to um, really dig in if you'd like or to share it with your friends and family. Um, and the recording will also be available afterward as well, all on this NCSU microsite. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and pass it back to Deja. Thanks so much, Caroline. Really appreciate you. Now, I hope you guys are ready to get down and I guess dirty, but without getting our hands dirty um, as we talk about trees. And I would really love to welcome our special guest this week, um, Dr. Steph Jeffrey. Pronoun she, her, hers, is an associate teaching professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at NC State University. She's a naturalist at heart and a forest ecologist by training. She currently teaches several classes at NC State, Dendrology, which focuses on the tree identification and natural history, Forest Communities, which is a part of a summer camp, and of course, Introduction to Environmental Science. She is most passionate about helping people discover their interests and inspire their commitment to the natural world. She is the co-author of an ecological hiking guide, Exploring the Southern Appalachian Forest, where she teaches readers how to see stories in the forested landscape. In her teaching, Dr. Jeffries focuses on service learning and hands-on projects to connect students' education um, to connect students' education to real-world applications and service ethics. Outdoors, she shares her love for the natural world and conservation with people of all ages and backgrounds. And let me tell you, I am so excited to have Dr. Jeffries as a guest today. I think she is absolutely awesome. I um, I love her YouTube page, and I think she's so great at teaching people about just the outdoors in general. So I'm so happy um, to have her. This is too tremendous an event to leave. Yes, that is so true, Dr. Cooper. <laughs> um, so if you all just want to go ahead and welcome our guests in the chat, feel free. Um, but other than that, we're going to get started with our icebreaker for the day. Um, please excuse my noisy dog in the background. So our first question on today's icebreaker is, you know, inquiring, inquiring minds would like to know, Dr. Jeffries, did 10-year-old you ever imagine that you would be working with trees or with anything related to the trees and outdoors? So thank you, Caroline and Deja and Karen for having me tonight. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so my mom loves telling a story about how we had this really diseased saucer magnolia in our yard and, and how my dad had to you know that was an illustrious start, but as a kid, I was a serious tree climber. Um, we had a European hazel in our yard growing up that had this great architecture with branches coming out from the ground. And actually my grandmother, my Nana had a huge, um, she called it a copper beach. I guess it was probably a European beach and it had low enough branches that I could scramble into the canopy. And so I spent a lot of time, it was one of my favorite places to hide for hide and seek um, because no one ever thought to look up. So it was one of my secret favorite hiding places and just a place to hang out and see the world. So maybe not so far off. I really love that. Um, so were you the reigning champion of hide and seek in your household? <laughs> there were a few of my hiding places that no one ever found me. <laughs> there was a, we, that, had a, we also had great. a you in our yard. Yeah. And like, that was, that was kind of sad because then everybody would go home and, you know, I'd be up there still, <laughs> but I always had to try and, you know, wait till everybody left so I could, so I could climb out of the tree without being detected. Oh, cool. So I guess speaking of trees and hopping right down into it, um, inquiring minds, in, inquiring minds would like to know what, if you could be any tree, what tree would you be? So this is a, that's a fun question. Um, so one of my favorite trees, and I say that a lot, 
Uh, but one of my favorite trees is a Southern Appalachian endemic. It's only found in the Southern Appalachians and it's um, called Table Mountain Pine. It's Pinus pungens. And I always think of um, Table Mountain Pine, it's, it's tough, it's really gnarly. It's got a really stunted form and it loves growing in high places with beautiful views. Um, that would be a pretty cool place to be. You have to be a lover of extremes, which I am a lover ex of extremes. So it's fire, it's a fire dependent species. Um, so it's, it's a very resilient tree and um, tough and gnarly and loves the high places. I love that. I think that is like a great way to describe to describe yourself. I mean, resilient, fiery, gnarly, tough. Like I love it. <laughs> so I do weird great. things for um, fun. <laughs> I'm curious to know. Do you have a favorite fun fact about trees? Um, so one of my, I, I like um, trees and literature and even children, that extends to children's literature. So I would say that um, one of my favorite fun facts is that of the, and this is a, a trivia question that students usually get wrong. Um, I asked which of the hundred acre wood friends lived in a beech tree. And most people think it was owl because owls like living in trees, but um, owl lived in the chestnuts, if I can quote A.A. A. Milne, right? So owl lived in the chestnuts, an old world residence of great charm, which was somehow better than all the others. Remember owl is a sort of elitist. <laughs> and, but actually it was the piglet who lived in a beech tree. So the quote is that um, the piglet lived in the middle or the, the beech tree was in the middle of the hundred acre wood and the piglet lived in the middle of the tree. Probably a European beech. Wow, that is really cool. That is a fun fact that I never knew about Winnie the Pooh. That is, um, that is so <laughs> cute, love it. <laughs> and so I guess our last question for inquiring minds want to know, we want to know what is something that you wish everyone knew about trees? So I, I do a project with my Introduction to Environmental Science classes, and I, I think I have a couple of alums in the audience here from that project, where we measure um, 100 trees on campus um, during class, which is quite an undertaking with the 250 students. Um, but we send them out in teams, and they go find, they have to go locate and find their trees and then measure them. And it's partly to understand the impact of impervious surface or pavement um, on tree growth. So this is a question that we're hoping to learn more of, but what I've, I've been reading through student responses to the big picture, what did you learn from this project question? And it's really great to see how students are realizing, you know, I think most of us know like, oh, trees provide oxygen, that's why they're important, but all the suite of ecosystem services, um, and that's, you know, Trees do wonderful things for us and they're really important in urban environments. So they filter loads of stormwater. Right before we went on, I thought, oh, I should look up. And I, I looked up in the tree benefit calculator that a 10 inch diameter American beech tree will filter 1400 gallons of water in a year. And, you know, that's really significant, especially considering all the rain we've had. We're at the second, the second wettest winter on record. And so that's really, really important for them to filter that stormwater. Um, they take up CO2, so they're really important for carbon sequestration. Um, they provide shade, right? So they combat the urban heat island effect. So trees really have a, an important role. It's, it's a tough place for trees to live, um, but they're extremely important in these urban environments. I'm curious, um, how resilient are beech trees um, are they some? Are they a tree that would be good to plant in an urban environment since they uptake so much water? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, we actually have a couple of beech trees that were planted pretty recently on Dan Allen Drive, um, right next to Jordan Hall. And I'm here. I've been watching them to see how well they're going to do. Um, I don't know that it's commonly used as a street tree. They're very slow growers, um, but uh, and I don't know if they're more apt to take up water than not. I, like, I don't know if they're especially good at taking up water compared with other species, um, but they are in our measurement 
they're in our measurement group. So, um, so anyway, we do, yes, somebody just commented anything other than Bradford pear. We do have a list of species on campus that we, that are on the do not plant list. Um, Bradford pear is one of those, it's invasive, um, it doesn't live very long, um, but we have other plant, other trees that unfortunately in urban environments tend to get um, certain types of diseases. So we're trying to diversify our trees on campus. I think there's a really big opportunity for that. Um, and so we're trying to see what trees do well in these kinds of environments. That would be a really interesting study that I would love to see, just trying to see you know, more about the diversity of trees on campus and which ones do best, like, that would be great. I would love to know more about that. And if our audience doesn't have any questions, we are going to move right into our project for the week, our special feature project. So this week we are featuring um, Mysterious Bumpy Beach Bark. And we just want to know how exactly, well, one, what is this project? What is Mysterious Bumpy Beach Bark? Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about this project. So several years ago, I um, started noticing that beech trees around the triangle area where I live had, some of them had this kind of surface level bumps on, on the bark. And so I wondered about it. I sent it off, photos off to a couple of people I knew. Nobody seemed to know what it was. Um, nobody was overly concerned. There was a consensus, no, it's not beach bark disease. So that was reassuring to hear. And, you know, I've, I've kind of seen them here and there, not super often, but definitely I've seen it many different places. And this spring I was out and saw, I was out in the mountains to sea trail up at Falls Lake. I like running up there. And um, I saw a whole stand that had quite a lot of bumpy beaches. Um, pretty much every tree in the stand that I was looking at had some level of these surface bumps on the bark. And so I, and there was one that was dead that was very, very bumpy. And I thought, hmm, this doesn't look, this doesn't look great. So I took some pictures of it and I sent it off to my colleagues at NC State and Forest Health. So Drs. Rod, Robert Jatan and Kelly Oten, who is in extension forestry and said, hey, you know what this is all about? Like, what have you seen this before? Is this something you know anything about? And they said, no. But then they said, let's go look at it. So we went back up to the mountains to sea trail. Um, we went in and looked at it and they brought some things to sort of scrape it away to see, you know, if there was anything underneath it. And so they're both, um, they're both trained in forest entomology. And so their conclusion was, it is not an insect. But Meanwhile, we posted it on Twitter and social media, and we got several other responses from people around the country who said, I, I've seen this, I've seen this before, but nobody knows what it is. So we thought, well, why don't we put it up on iNaturalist and see how common it is. So that was kind of how we got our start. I really love that collective observation leading to a project. I mean, I think the story of bumpy beach, of, of how, you know, mysterious bumpy beach bark came to be is an important story for so many people to hear because anybody can just, you know, create, make an observation and say, hey, I think this is worthy of having more eyes on it and, and worthy of investigating, which I think is, is amazing. Um, and so I'm curious as to um, what, I guess what motivated you to turn this into a citizen science project and put this on iNaturalist instead of just saying, huh, that's bumpy beach bark, oh well. So I think in my bio, I, I said that I, I am a naturalist at heart and a forest ecologist by training. So as a scientist, I have this kind of relentless curiosity about the world and trying to understand things that I see. I don't pursue everything that I'm curious about because I would never sleep, right? But, um, but this was something I'd noticed before. I'd noticed it, you know, kept sort of, I'd see it enough that it reminded me that, gosh, I, somebody's got to know what this is and what, it, what it's about and how widespread it is. And so when I was talking to um, Robert Jatan and Kelly Oten about it, you know, we thought, okay, well, they, they sent it off to some of their colleagues, right? This is how science works, right? So 
you send it off, you, you find some experts in the field and send off your observations and say, what do you know about this? Can you share? Do you know anything? How widespread is it? Is it harmful to the trees? And, you know, everything just kept coming back question marks. And so I thought I had put, you know, as a matter of habit, I put things on iNaturalist just because I, I like documenting things. Um, and then I thought, well, gosh, this would be a great project for iNaturalist because it wouldn't just rely on me calling 15 or 20 scientists that I know in this area. Um, you know, a colleague of mine at the University of Georgia said, I'm seeing this around Athens. And so I thought, well, what better way to document than, than to crowdsource it? Because this is something that, you know, as long as you can identify American Beach and then you start seeing this, this phenomenon, you can document it. I, I can use anybody's, I have the eyes of the world looking for this as long as they know what to look for. So it was exciting for me to think about how very quickly we could get, you know, we don't know a whole lot about this um, yet, but there's so many questions we could ask about it. And then we can use these observations from iNaturalist to ask and answer questions to get to know a little bit more about it that we didn't know before. I really love that. So can anyone participate in this project? Um, I know it's a, you know, we're, we're relying on the eyes of many, but is, is there any limitation in age or like who, who is your community of, of users? Who, who, who should participate in this project? I really think that this project is open to a really broad audience. Um, you know, right now with, with people being stuck inside for COVID, this is a really safe way to get outside and enjoy nature. We've seen loads of, you know, how our parks and greenways are, are almost crowded with people who are looking for that mental health break. And this gives you a little bit of something to focus on. Um, it's a great way to volunteer if you wanna get involved in a scientific effort. And it doesn't take a lot of um, special training or tools. Um, I, I'm gonna show you tonight how to identify American beach because it is just for that species that we're looking for. Um, but it's something that anybody can see. And so um, like a lot of observation projects, it's one of those things that, you know, now when I'm walking through the woods, like I'm always looking for it. So I went hiking with my husband yesterday down on the coast and I was, you know, I just found myself sort of scanning the woods, looking around and then sure enough, I found a beech tree that had bumpy bark. So yes, I am going to, Georgia, thank you for that question. I am going to post some photos. Um, and I'm hoping that some of you in the audience will be will say like, oh, I've seen that. But I think teachers could do this with, um, with their kids, whether they're at home, right? So we have a lot of um, students who are still at home learning and um, homeschool for sure. Um, any kind of citizen science groups, I think it, it should be fine. I actually have a quick question. Deja, you asking about who can participate made me think. Um, I'm wondering what, what's been the best contribution or something that has really added to the project that citizen scientists have helped you with? Because, um, you know, someone could conceivably do this by themselves. They just ran around looking for trees all day. But what's been the, the most valuable contribution from citizen scientists for your research so far with this project? Um, well, so the project has only been a project for maybe three or four weeks. <laughs> so, but I'm going to show you a map of some of our observations. And I've got, you know, thanks to spreading the word through social media and programs like this, I have some observations from elsewhere in the Carolinas, places that I haven't visited. I've got an observation from Ohio. Um, and so it's a real opportunity to see much farther than I can on my own two feet with my own camera. Hear that everybody? This project is very fresh. You're getting in at the very beginning. <laughs> you get a huge impact up front. I told Deja, I said, I'll go on your show as long as you don't expect me to know a whole lot about what, what we're looking at, right? But this is, this is the, the fun time to be a scientist. It really is. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted you on the show. I think it's great to have the perspective of a new project because a lot of the projects we feature on this show have been, you know, going on for a long time. But I think it's great to finally have the perspective of, you know, when somebody's just jumping in to um, citizen science. So uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat. 
especially related to um, what beach looks like and what does the bumpy beach look like. So can you walk us through how to do mysterious bumpy beach bark and how exactly do we go about identifying a beach tree? Sure, let me share my screen real quick. I put together a few slides just to um, make it easier. Oops, hang on. And I can show you instead of just telling you, right? And I, I recognizing too that some of you already know how to identify bumpy beach park. I do see some dendrology grads in here. So I'm happy that you're here. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Great. Okay, so I'm going to show you just these are mostly just photos. So this is a really good season to get involved with this project. So a lot of our nature based iNaturalist projects. Um, there's not a whole lot of leaves on trees right now. <laughs> um, and that's going to be the case for another month or so. But if you go walking anywhere on the East Coast, right, with this is the range for American Beach or Fagus grandifolia, you'll often see these beautiful tan leaves. Like if, you, if you're a fan of Umstead Park, this is a great time of year to see beach, right? So beach retains its leaves. Um, it retains dead leaves on the branches throughout the winter. Again, we're not really quite sure why. This is why science is so cool. It's all about discovery. If we knew everything, it would be kind of sad. So. Um, as you look through the woods, you can really uh, readily identify American beach by these um, leaves. There's a fancy word for that called marcescence. Um, and so they turn tan and they're held on the trees throughout the winter. They won't drop until the new leaves emerge in the spring. So this is bumpy beach bark. So if you're looking at this and you don't know how to identify American beach, you may not be very phased by this, but if you do know American beach, you know it to have very, very smooth, um, thin, lovely, beautiful gray, light gray bark. And so I was running through this stand on my one of my favorite running tracks, and I noticed that this tree was covered in this bump. So I was like, well, it almost looks like tree acne, right? But this is a mature tree, right? So it's not a juvenile, not a juvenile issue here. Um, and you can see that the bark is, tends to be more bumpy down and low, and then it's less so as you go up high. And like I was saying earlier, that the entire stand I was in, as I looked around, had bumpy beach bark. So this is when I invited um, Dr. Stratan and Oten to come out and check it out. So they came out and looked at one tree that was actually dead, um, that had really significant bumps on it. And, you know, they picked apart they sort of shaved off the bump to see if there was an insect underneath. And conclusion was not an insect. So that's something that we know, right? So sometimes the early part of science is figuring out what something is not. So um, it is also, I'm gonna show you later. So just quickly, you know, this photo on the left is a healthy, normal American beach. I know it's an American beach because it has this gray bark. It does get splotches on it. Sometimes those are lichens and sometimes it's just variation in the beach. And then it's got these tan leaves. So that, that's helping me confirm that it's, that it's beach. And then the photo on the right shows a kind of a mild case of bumpy beach bark. And there's kind of gradations, right? So you've got on the far left, kind of a normal tree. And then I found trees that just have a few bumps. Then you've got trees that have more, right? And this can be a tree of any age. And then we've got kind of gradations of severity. Um, and some of this extreme case, the bumps are sort of look like they're growing together. Um, something we don't know is if this is harmful to the tree or not. It may not be harmful at all. It may just be an anomaly. So one question we had immediately was this is beech bark, is this beech bark disease? So beech bark disease um, is common in the Northeast northeastern U.S. and Canada, um, where beaches are common. And it's kind of an, um, it's an interaction between an aphid. So you see this photo here in the center. It's got the white, um, or, or it's not an aphid, I'm sorry. It's a scale insect. You can tell I'm not a forest entomologist. It's a scale insect. So it is a non-native insect that opens up cracks in the beach bark. Beach bark is very, very thin. And then that allows an inoculation by a fungal pathogen 
neonectria to get in. And so what it causes, right? So a beach that's got um, beach bark disease has got these big open lesions on the bark. That is not what we have. Um, the other thing is this map is a little bit old. It's from 2015. Um, and it shows, you know, we've got a little bit of beach bark disease in the mountains of North Carolina, but not yet, thankfully, in the Piedmont. So we know it's not that, and we know it's not an insect, but we don't know really much about what it is. So um, I'm going to show you on iNaturalist. Let me, let me quickly go into beach identification. So if you're new to learning American beach, right, so you might Notice it through the forest right now with its tan leaves. Those are going to drop soon. And like I said, the bark is thin and pale gray. Now the splotches are pretty normal. That's something that we see lots of variation on. Um, you can see this is another, another one. I know it's American beach because it has this smooth, thin gray bark, um, a little bit splotchy. This time of year, it has those tan leaves, the marcescent leaves that are retained. It has really beautiful leaves that got um, very regular venation on them. So um, veins that are in parallel to each other. And then the other character I wanna point out. So when you think you've got American beech, there's one more thing I want you to check and that's to look at the buds. So the buds are here at the ends of the branches and you can see maybe in this photo, right, right here, those, those buds are long and pointy in the fall and winter. And here's a close up. So there's really no other tree that has all of these characters together. So when you think you've got American beech, see if you can find a branch that's low enough to the ground that you can check these buds out because that'll help you confirm the ID. And you know, the other thing is if you're not sure of your identification, it's okay because you're gonna upload your observations to iNaturalist. Those are um, verified, right, by people other users of iNaturalist will go in and verify your identification. So you don't have to worry that, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's wrong. It's okay. Upload it. Um, oh, and this is a little bit of trivia. So these beech leaves, like, this is fascinating. One year I, I took a whole series of photographs over the course of a month um, of two beech buds in my yard. And how I was curious about how they opened up. And so this is a series of photos that I took I don't have every day over the month, but I just tried to take, include photos of when it changed. So you can see the beach buds getting longer and longer, and then they start to open up. And so each one of those buds ended up having eight leaves in it, which is crazy. <laughs> I thought that was so cool. I'm kind of a dork. Um, and then this is how you identify American beach in the summer. You can see the buds are not quite as big because they're still developing. And this is the bright green leaves in the summer. And I had to include a picture of beach flowers because they're really cool and extremely cute. Um, and they're one of those things that once you see them and start noticing them, you're really excited because you know what they are. I don't think I have any more beach photos. And so that's a little bit about identification. Any questions about how to be sure you've got a beach, American beach? Um, mainly, uh, I see a question in the Q&A about any ideas about what might be causing the bumpy bark and along those lines, any thoughts on the implications of the bumpy bark for forest and or wildlife ecology, but I know you mentioned that you don't really know what it is quite yet, right? Right, so um, yeah, we really don't know what it is. It could be, you know, I think one of our next steps in the project is as these trees leaf out in the spring, we're curious to see if the trees with bumpy beech bark have full canopies or do they seem to not be doing as well? Because right now we don't even know if this is something that's harmful. For all we know, this could be just a genetic anomaly, right? So if I have blue eyes, you know, I'm human, I just happen to have blue eyes, right? Some beaches might just happen to have bumpy bark. I can tell you that I've seen some stands of beech trees where all the trees have bumpy bark, and I've seen stands where there's mixed, um, some bumpy and some not. So I'm not really sure what that tells us, but yeah, we're going to be watching these and observing these trees, which is another reason why getting some known locations on the map is really important. And you also have lots of comments in the chat about how amazing everyone thinks this, and uh, 
that there it's amazing that there are eight leaves and a narrow bud and people, people are saying i love the photo progression of the buds turning into leaves who knew so that was so fun fans in here yeah <laughs> that was such a fun project to do i was i was well actually the first two weeks were pretty boring because nothing was happening <laughs> but eventually yeah they they cut out and i have a friend who took a series of photographs of the old leaves and when they finally dropped because she was curious there's a, there's a, I don't know if it's a, it's a tree, there's a tree legend out there that all the leaves fall off the beech trees on the same day. And she, she showed that that was bunk. <laughs> it does seem sudden, like you'll be walking around and suddenly you'll realize that there are no more tan leaves on trees. But they, what's cool is I've noticed they get lighter and lighter. And so they, it's almost like they turn into little beech leaf ghosts and then fly off the trees and let the new ones open up and the new leaves are beautiful. They're, they're just a beautiful bright green, spring green color. That's amazing. So it's really easy to participate, right? I see um, it's almost as simple as taking a photo and describing it, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, let me link over to the project and I'll show you what we found so far, right? So I don't have much to report, but I've got a little bit. Um, and here's another thing, as you're, so this is a great way to just practice your tree identification, right? So now you all know how to identify American Beach and you should take photos and practice uploading them to iNaturalist. It is just as important for us to understand where bumpy beaches are not as much as where they are. So in the project, you're gonna upload your observations with Phagus grandifolia is the species name and you know, if I have a spot on a map, if there are no dots there, no beach observations there, I do not know if it's a parking lot. I do not know if it is, um, I spent some time last weekend at Black Mountain, too high elevation, too gnarly for, for beaches up where I was. So I don't, but if there are no points, I don't know if it's because the beaches aren't there. If it's because there's no forest there, maybe it's a meadow. Um, and so we need, you know, we need to know where, where bumpy beaches are as well as where they're not. So this is the link to the SciStarter project, which looks awesome. And um, I can participate from here. Let's see, I guess I'm going to participate from the web. I'm looking to link to iNaturalist and thought, yeah, I'm going to join the project. So this is the project and how it looks on iNaturalist. If you're new to using iNaturalist, it is a free program. So you can put an app on your phone, which is very convenient because you're, most of you are probably taking photos with your phones, um, or you can set up a, an account on the web. So that's what I'm gonna to demonstrate today. So this is the project and you can see I have um, 17 members so far. I'm excited. I think a couple people joined today. Um, and you can see that these are some of the observations. If I click on this, you'll see that I do have an observation here of a smooth beach, right? So this is one that doesn't have bumpy beach bark. It puts in all of your, ops. once you join the project, all of your beach observations automatically are added. And you can see the variation in bumps. Like this tree does not even look like, it's just got so many, um, it's so bumpy. I would, you know, which is crazy bumpy, but that's definitely American Beach. You can see the tan leaves up here. So um, if you're adding to the project, I'm gonna go to upload and then you choose file. So this is how I'm doing it on a PC, but um, I don't know how to show you how to do it on your phone, but it's even easier on your phone. And then, okay, so I've got this photograph that I took yesterday at Island Creek in the Croatian National Forest and I'm opening up. I can type in the name, the name, the scientific name. So you can ask for help with identification and it will probably suggest, but um, you can type in Vegas grandifolia, large leaf. Okay, and then the date was yesterday. The location, so this is a little tricky. On your phone, it's automatically referenced to the photo, so you don't have to worry about trying to find the exact location. Here I've got to scroll in. I was in the Croatian National Forest and this little 
pocket up here. So I'm going to put a point here, update my observation. And then this is really important. There's a little thing here on the web where you can add a tag. I'm going to add the tag bumpy peach bark. And here's why. In the project, I cannot filter observations by bumpy beach bark, but I can use the explore function to search for beach trees with that tag. So that's a way for me to pull up only the bumpy beach observations. Then I can submit and it is in the database. So now it's going to my observations. Now I wanna show you where I've gotten stuff so far. So, okay, this is my account. So I can go up here to explore and click on this and put in Vegas Grand Victoria, American Beach, right? So it has the common name there for reference. And then the other thing I want to put in, you can see there's, you know, this helps you see the range of American Beach in North America. And then I can put it a filter and put in bumpy beach bark as my tag. Okay, and update it and you can see, oh, I don't have as many observations as I used to, right? But these are all the observations I have so far that are tagged bumpy beach bark. Um, and so you'll see like, the, you know, I don't, these are citizen scientists who have uploaded their observations. So I can see that instead of just being limited to Falls Lake and Raleigh, I'm zooming in. Right, so here are my little bumpy beaches. Um, I found them on a couple of trails that I've hiked locally, but imagine if I had to try and find all of them on my own, that would be crazy. Um, so yeah, you know, this project, I think as scientists, we can't get flummoxed by all that we don't know. We would be discouraged very easily, but to me, like discovery is the best part. And this is the perfect time to get involved because, you know, over time, you know, we don't know, maybe bumpy beaches, maybe this is something in urban environments. Uh, maybe there's a certain forest type where they tend to be bumpy. We really, there's so many questions out there um, and lots of different pathways to explore. So I'm really excited to have help in locating this phenomenon. That's amazing. It looks like there's a question in the chat. Um, someone's wondering, Possibly a silly question. There are no silly questions. This is Make It Count Monday. You can ask anything. Um, but someone asked, should we tag smooth beach bark as bumpy beach bark so it still shows up in your results? Or should we only actually tag bumpy beach bark? I would say just tag bumpy beach bark um, because your smooth beach bark observations will automatically be added to the project. So if you're a member, if you've joined the project, all of your beach observations will be in there but the tag helps me just separate out the bumpy beach bark. It's something that maybe if I was a more experienced user of iNaturalist, there would be a better way to do this. <laughs> but this is the way I figured out that, that will work for now. <laughs> Great question though. Thanks for clarifying that. That's, that's important. Yeah, no, and I, I really urge all of you, like, please don't be afraid to ask questions. And we'll have another segment at the end where you all are able to step up to the mic and uh, raise your hands and be unmuted. Um, it looks like there's one more question in the chat um, that we can ask before we move on to the next section. I know, I know Deja has some questions for educators because a lot of educators attend these events. Um, somebody asked, um, is American Beach harvested commercially um, and would sawmill operators have data on where and with what frequency they see bumpy beach bark coming in? Oh, that's a great question. There's a lot of examples um, in our scientific history about how we're able to obtain historical data from things like commercial records. Uh, American beach is not especially used commercially. Um, it does have some usage for things like carving, things like wooden spoons, bowls, and things like that, but it's not harvested on a large scale um, for sawmill. It doesn't make good lumber. So I don't think we'll have those kinds of historic records. I mean, it, yeah, it would be interesting to see. It is a big problem um, among commercial forest operations in the Northeast because the beech bark disease 
which is that other disease I showed you photos of, that is killing, it kills the beaches back and then they re-sprout. So it ends up making a forest of very shrubby beaches that, you know, really can't, you know, if you're a commercial forester, they really can't be used for anything, but they also don't make great wildlife habitat because they're not living long enough to produce the um, beach nuts. Although that, that beach bark disease has been around since the 1800s, I was reading that recently. Um, and so there's some genetic resistance to it. There are certainly individuals that don't get it. And luckily we haven't seen it in the Piedmont of North Carolina yet. Good question. I wish we could get that data. That's another thing we have to be careful of with our, um, with how we collected data. So my guess is that most citizen scientists who I reach will be living in urban areas because most people live in urban areas. And so if I get a lot of um, bumpy beaches in urban areas, I won't necessarily know, unless I do more research, whether that's because more bumpy beaches are in urban areas or if that's because that's an artifact of our observations. Yeah, and um, really quick question, how long do you think the project will run? Because uh, I was doing some research and it looks like beach trees make it as far south as to Gainesville. So when I'm back at UF, I, I want to participate. I want to go chase down some beech trees. Yeah, it's great. I was talking to my parents live on the eastern shore of Maryland. So I was telling my dad about it the other day and I promised I'd send him pictures and I uploaded iNaturalist to his, his um, iPad. So I'm hoping he'll look out for it for me. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be really great if we could get observations from the entire range. Um, we'll just have to see how quickly we can get that data. And then also, you know, some of the follow-up data on is this, uh, you know, if this is something that is a forest health concern, more energy might be put into it than if it's just a curiosity. Wow, yeah, and someone just Oh, so I'll let Deja take the next one and then we'll get to the question at the end. Yeah, I'm just curious um, to know if, I guess what, so I know this project is important, but can you share with our audience what, I guess, what would we be missing if all the, let's say that this bumpy, um, this bumpy condition turns out to be a disease if all the beech trees disappeared, what would we be missing? Why is it important that we get to the bottom of this, of this question that we have? Yeah, I think um, that is a good question. And, I, and like I said, I don't, we don't know yet whether this is something that harms trees or whether it's a harmless disease or if it's just a genetic variant. Um, beech trees do have a really important place in our ecosystem. A lot of times though, I think that it's important to realize that just because we don't know what its ecological role is, doesn't mean that it's not important. <laughs> so I always wanna be a little bit sort of my uh, cautious about, about saying that, but I know some things we do know about American beaches, um, they are occupy forests in this area um, in the South. They like, they really favor the cool moist slopes and they're often um, places where there are lots of abundant wildflowers. There are canopy species um, in forest stands that don't have fire. They're very um, thin barked and so they, they don't do well in fire. Um, and so that's, that's one important thing. The mast that they produce, so those um, beech nuts, I didn't put pictures of those, but beech nuts are a thing. And um, they, they're in these little husks and there's two little nuts per husk. Those are an important wildlife food um, for um, lots of different wildlife species, as well as some birds. Um, so those are, those are also important for that. They provide cover in the winter time with the retention of leaves and branches um, for, so shelter for wildlife. Um, there's a really cool parasitic species of plant um, called beech drops. Y'all have probably seen them. Um, that grow, they, they're semi-parasitic, so they don't have, they have flowers, but no chlorophyll. And they, they pop up, you see the dry, I often notice them this time of year, because the dried stalks are sticking up and they, they parasitize beech roots. So that's, a, that's another just little thing that depends on um, beech trees. So, um, and I, it, there's a really cool paper that just came out about 
species of trees that have the highest um, insect diversity, that have the highest number of um, butterflies, that have caterpillars that depend on the leaves for food. And I know that um, oaks are in that category and beeches are in the same family as oaks, but I haven't, I need to read the paper. I should have read it beforehand to see if, if beaches are included in that. So lots of, lots of wildlife value from things, you know, at the bottom of the food chain up to um, higher trophic levels. Thank you for sharing. That's really good to know. I mean, we have a really good question here um, in our Q&A box. We have a, um, a question that says, I'm a librarian in Alpena, Michigan, and am planning a citizen science program throughout 2021. Two questions, are there American beech trees in my area and would staff consider presenting the project via virtual program for my community? Oh, well, that would be a lot of fun. I would love to go to Michigan, even if it is only virtually. So here's what, why don't we do this? I'm going to take this filter off. Oops, I thought I was going to take the filter off. Um, I'm going to reset it. So now we can see, because I don't, I'm not familiar with where you are in Michigan. I'm going to search American Beach, Vegas. Let's see if we can let's see it, search by common name. Yeah, okay, so you can search by common name too if Vegas grandifolia is um, not in your repertoire yet. So it looks to me like there is certainly beech trees in Michigan. So it might be something I would love to certainly get data for Michigan that I don't already have. So um, depends on where you are, like maybe not there's even some in the UP, but uh, yeah, that would be that would be a great project. And like I said, you know, as long as you can identify American Beach, which I showed you all how to do that, I have a video too on how to identify it um, with some other project information. I haven't quite gotten it on the project yet, um, but that's something I'll be publishing to make it easily shareable. And I'd love to talk to your classes. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome, thank you. I love that Making Out Monday is helping to make these connections. This is awesome. And I will say, I, after seeing you go through this demo and showing us how to use it, I am so excited to get out there and one, try my hand at identifying American Beach and two, just trying to see if I can find some bumpy beach bark out there. I mean, I, I think that I've seen it before, but now I have, you know, this, renewed enthusiasm for going out there and seeing if I can actually make some observations and and help contribute to this project and that would be awesome but yeah I'm super excited and you know it was great because I was on I posted on Twitter and somebody posted back and said oh I'm gonna I think I've seen it at Hemlock Bluff so I'm gonna look for it this weekend and then sure enough those observations popped up they found it so it's kind of a fun fun thing to like a scavenger hunt it, it, it is exactly like a scavenger hunt. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left and I know based off our last question, we have a few educators um, in the audience and we also still have a few more audience questions, but um, I was just wondering, one, how would you communicate this project to get someone who isn't interested in um, trees to participate and make some observations and contribute to the project? Um, so that's a great question. I have, I have um, two teenagers at home who aren't always as excited about tree identification as I am. Um, but, um, and actually they're not into the Pokemon Go, but I was really amazed to see how popular that was. And, and it's been used by a lot of educators to get people outdoors. I think you know, as this pandemic is sort of dragged on, a lot of people are finding a renewed connection um, to be outdoors in this and using iNaturalist as kind of a bridge to that, right? So you're using information on your smartphone, um, a cool, fun app that you can use. Once you get into iNaturalist, I mean, it's really addictive. I, I'm not an entomologist, but I use it for insects all the time because 
I'm just fascinated. You know, I, I take a picture, I put it in, it, it gives me top 10 guesses of what it is. Often it's right on the money. Um, and so it's a really fun app to use to get to know the natural world around you even more. And I think it's, you know, it's fun to feel like you're contributing. You can see your points on the map. So anybody who submits points can go and um, see all that data crop up. You can check in on us, you know, a couple months from now and see how we're doing with our observations. Um, and I think, you know, it was funny at my dendrology class last fall, we had to go online like many classes. And it was, to me, it was disappointing to have to teach tree identification, which I love so much and I love teaching it in the field, but to teach it online. And a lot of students commented that it was really helpful for their mental health to have something like that to focus on um, to get outdoors and, you know, kind of learn something a little bit, you know, with a little bit of help, but a, a lot on their own. So I hope people think it's fun um, and want to participate. Even if they're not tree people and they don't love tree jokes. <laughs> you know, and I, I really love that too. Um, and the fact that that helped them with their mental health. And I really think for me, if I wasn't interested in trees, which I am, just not as much, you know, y'all know I'm a bird person, but <laughs> I really even think um, the idea of a scavenger hunt would have gotten me outside, like, oh, we're going to go on a scavenger hunt and let's see if we can find these tree anomalies, you know, and, and you don't have to, to go. Attention. Yeah, you don't even have to go any, like, you can walk out, your, I have beech trees in my yard, I'm lucky enough to have beech trees in my yard, but they're very common trees, so it's not, you don't, it's not hard to find them. And it really shouldn't be hard to find now that we have all this knowledge on how to ID them after this, after today's episode of Making Out Monday. Let's see, Carolyn, do we have any additional questions in the chat? I know we only have three minutes left. This time has passed by so quickly. I was like, you want me to talk for an hour? Oh my gosh. Uh, we have one more question in the chat. Um, Edward was wondering, how does bumpy beech bark differ from beech bark disease? So that's a really important question. Um, I'm going to show you my pictures that I have of um, beech bark disease. Okay, so here's my, these are my, some of my best photos of bumpy beech bark. And you can see their surface surface bumps like so we dug we dug into them and they don't go into the tree there's nothing growing into the tree it's just a surface level bump on the bark um this is beech bark disease and what it looks like so it's like i said it's a um two stage thing so there are these um scale insects that's these kind of white insects on the outside of this very smooth beech tree and that those scale insects um penetrate the bark the bark is very thin so it's pretty susceptible to any kind of insect attack. Um, and then once they open up openings in the bark, then the fungal pathogen, which is Neonectria is the genus, can get in and it starts causing these big lesions. And the, the tree's defense response actually ends up girdling the tree. So that's what kills, that's what kills it. But you can see from these, you know, big open openings in the bark that this is much different looking than bumpy beech bark. So I don't think it's hard to, I think you'll be able to separate them pretty easily. Good question, important okay. question. Any, any final thoughts for us? Any calls to action for the audience? I just want you all to get out there with your phones and you know, now you can go out and you can identify American beech, which is a wonderful native tree. Um, you can help contribute to this project, you know, on your morning walk, your evening walk, your after work lunch walk. Um, just go outside with your phone and and help us track this down. I think. Let me see if I can issue a little challenge here. Um, so right now I have. Uh, so if I if you want to look at the project, you have to go to community. And then mysterious bumpy beach bark is listed here. And so right now I have 81 observations of American beach. So how many people are on this call, right? If each of you does five, right? That'll 
that'll get us lots of extra observations. So, and hopefully like where you are. So my Michigan person, I want you to look and see if you can find beach trees wherever you are. Great way to get outside, especially before, you know, there's no spring wildflowers yet. So it's a really fun time um, to be outside as the weather gets nicer. And if you all are out of range, I know we have a global audience for these events sometimes, you know, get to know the trees in your community, you know, yes, probably trees where you are. Um, or at least some sort of plant, and you can find it. Even if it's just like a weed growing up from the sidewalk, you could put that on iNaturalist, and that would be an awesome observation. Yeah, iNaturalist is super fun. Great. Deja, do you have any final thoughts for us as we go into next week? I don't have very many thoughts. Um, I am just so excited to go outside and contribute and try and, you know, try my hand at this project. I love that you issued this challenge to our to our viewers. And I think that might be something that we incorporate, have to start incorporating every week because I want you all to start participating in these projects. Um, but I guess the last thing I want to just say is thank you so much for coming on the show and joining us and telling us all about the project. It was um, so great to learn about American Beach and, of course, mysterious bumpy beach marks this week. And I also want to thank all of you all out there in the audience. Um, thank you so much for taking that time to join us today. And if you are an NC State student interested in citizen science, please consider joining the Citizen Science Club. And I just want to give a special thanks to the um, NCSU Citizen Science Campus Program and, of course, SciStarter for making this all possible. Thank you all so much for tuning in to, tuning in to today's episode and join us next week. Um, and I guess next week I'm your special guest and Caroline will be interviewing me <laughs> about all the things I do with citizen science. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. See you next week, Deja. And uh, thank you to Dr. Jeffries. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Bye. Bye.